Hi everyone, my name is Steph, this is The Novelty Corner and welcome or welcome back to my channel and I'm going to apologise for how I sound because right before I pressed record I had a coughing fit, which seems to be the trend at the moment. So if I sound a little rough, that's why. But we are here with a Books Beside My Bed video, which is the wrap up of my last week's worth of reading, minus any vlog projects. And there have been a few ongoing things over the last couple of weeks. So if you follow me on Goodreads or Storygraph, you have probably seen everything that I've read, but in the videos there's a slight discrepancy because not all the videos are out yet so stay tuned there's a few more coming in the upcoming weeks. What that does mean is that this should be a fairly short wrap-up for me because there's only five things to talk about in this video that do not belong in other projects so yeah let's jump straight into it. The first book I'm going to mention I have two kids slash middle grade uh, I have three kids slash middle grade titles I'm going to talk about this week. I don't always talk about every single kids title that I read on this channel usually it's review copies or things that are actual novel length stories. If you want to see everything else that I'm reading in the kids space, go over to Kidlit Joy. But the first book I'm going to talk about is The Skull by John Klassen and so many people have recommended this to me. I think the first person I heard talking about it was Ashley from Bookish Realm and then since then I've heard many people talk about it and I actually really love John Klassen's work. I have quite a few of his picture books. He has a very quirky storytelling style that's really fun actually and also the illustrative style in his books are just Top notch. So this book is an adaptation of a folktale and in it we have Attila who runs away from home and she stumbles across this old mansion and she is invited inside by a talking skull. They become friends and Attila finds out from the skull that the mansion is being haunted by a headless skeleton and Attila decides to remove the obstacle of this haunting from this house and it is really fun. It's it's not a long story. It looks like it would be a picture book, but it's, it's more novel length. There are chapters in here in different sections to the book. It was fun. It was, and it was really interesting. I was reading the author's note and John Klassen was saying how he'd once read this story in a library and then kept thinking about it for a long time afterwards. And then he, you know, emailed the library to try and find out what the story was that he had read. And when he went back to reread it, he realized that the story he had in his head was completely different to the story that was actually on the page because over time, he had turned it into something else in his mind, which is something that a lot of people do. I think the, the further we're removed we are from a story that means something or stuck with us. We tweak things in our head because that's just what we do naturally. And so he decided to rewrite the folktale the way that it ended in his head, which I thought was really cool. So this is an awesome little book. If you haven't seen it, it's well worth reading. Then I read the first two books in the series, Wyla the Koori Warrior. This is written by Jordan Gould and Richard Pritchard. And book one is Guardians, book two is Custodians. And this is an indigenous middle fiction series following Wyla, who is a young girl living in her village. She is excited because her grandmother has asked her to start stepping in and teaching art classes to the younger members of the village. And on Wyla's first day of classes, their village is attacked by dragons and Wyla's grandmother is killed and everyone in the village except for Wyla and the children that she was teaching have been taken and kidnapped. And Wyla ends up teaming up with the village guardian, who is a black cockatoo, to try and track down and figure out what's happening. And she is told that she needs to become the Kuri warrior, just like her grandmother before her, which means she needs to find the five other guardians from other villages surrounding her. This is very much a fantastical version of the colonization of Australia. So there are definite nods to that in here. I think depending on the level of understanding that kids have about colonization, will depend on whether they pick that up or not and or whether they just think of it as a adventure fantasy adventure story. It was really really interesting and I'm really enjoying the way that the dreaming stories are woven into here as, as part of Wyla's guiding beliefs. I like the exploration of the guardians who are all animal totems that are associated with respective villages and they all have respective totem items that help keep them safe and it's Wyla's journey of finding the courage to step into this role and a big part of the first two books is that she can communicate and work with her village's guardian no problem they get along great but she actually can't harness the magic of the totem yet because she doesn't believe that she's worthy of it yet so that's the first part of the the series and there is a third book coming out later this year which I'm really excited to read when it when it does come out but they're really fun there's some really cool illustrations in here and there's a lot of nods to not only the dreaming stories that are part of Australia's First Nations history but also things like drop bears and yaoi's and I totally forgot to say the other creature that features in the Koori Wari series is the bunyip. I love a story with a bunyip. I don't know maybe if you're outside of Australia you will have absolutely no idea what that is but I love a bunyip story. <laughs> All of those sort of creatures that we hear as growing up we heard stories of, seeing them in the story and seeing how they've been woven into the adventure is really really interesting. So I'm thoroughly enjoying this. I'm so glad that I finally picked it up. I read the series back to back 
this is another series ticked off my series to read list but I now will have to read the third book when it comes out but highly recommend these I mean they're great. I also listened to the poetry book Shame is an Ocean I Swim Across by Mary Lambert and this was just something that I stumbled across on Libby and you know borrowed out because I'm I'm always interested in listening to new poetry anthologies and collections and, and whatnot and next week there should be quite a few poetry and verse novels that I'm reading because there is a poetry readathon happening and I just I've got a stack of stuff so I thought I would read a lot of that in the upcoming week. But anyway, I was listening to this one and it is read by the author who I also believe is a musician and or singer as well as a spoken word poet. And this one deals with quite a few heavy topics including body shaming, homophobia, sexual assault. Like it's it's a really, really heavy subject matter. It kind of reminds me a little bit of Rupi Kaur's poetry work, which admittedly is not always my favorite thing to read and I don't want to say that because I don't want to diminish what the author has gone through at all because I think poetry is the way that you explore those feelings and how you have moved forward in your life and I, I think it's one of those weird places where I also feel really uncomfortable rating these kinds of poetry collections because they are about someone's life and experiences and how they've processed everything that they've been through. At the end of the day what I will say is it was probably not the poetry collection for me. That doesn't mean that it's a bad collection because it was really beautifully told. The way that Mary Lambert actually performs her poetry is stunning. There is music the whole way through that underpins all of the work. There's various sections and different stages of her life that are explored. Collectively it was a very well done poetry collection. Just not the one for me. But if you do go into it, just be warned, it is, there are a lot of content warnings in here. So just be in the right headspace for reading it. And then the last book that I read this week was I Want to Text You Up by Tegan Hunter, which is book two in her texting series. That is another series that I'm trying to read this year. I reckon I could just read anything by Tegan Hunter. They are just so light, easy, funny reads. I get so much joy out of reading her books. I think they're just really really great. The thing is she can take tropes and things that I don't even like and turn them into something that I really enjoy which was not necessarily the case here because I just enjoyed everything about this little story. So this is the story of Zoe whose best friend is the protagonist in the first book and has moved out to move in with her boyfriend. And so Zoe is looking for a new roommate and the person who replies to her ad happens to be her best friend's ex-boyfriend. And Zoe feels really weird about this even though Caleb says it doesn't bother him, he and Zoe's best friend are good. The best friend says it's fine. He's a good guy. We're good. Like it was an amicable split. And it becomes even more complicated for Zoe when she begins to admit to herself just how attracted she is to Caleb because she was attracted to Caleb when he was dating her best friend and she was never going to do anything about it. She just noticed that he was attractive. So anyway, this is a best friends, ex roommates to lovers, forced proximity situation. It is really fun. There is a lot of times where their time together is limited. So they might be living in the same space, but they both are studying and working a lot. And so a lot of their conversations happen over text because they never see each other. Caleb is also working through quite a few things with his personal life, which does impact on their relationship later on because he is reluctant to let anyone in. He had a very tough upbringing and is not particularly close with his mother or his brother. And they are a huge stressor on his life, but he doesn't want to burden anyone else with that. And I mean, this clearly fits in that new adult space, but it doesn't feel like college age kids. And I don't mean that in a bad way because I, they feel like they are new adult age people who are managing their lives and having to deal with the realities of working and studying and managing a relationship and time spent with other people without it being overly dramatic. I hope that makes sense because the thing that drives me nuts in a new adult style story is college age kids who are, you know, maybe in their early 20s behaving like they're 16. So I appreciated that about the story. And Tegan Hunter just writes text conversations between characters in such a good way. Like she does it in this series, she's done it in the Carolina Comet series. They are hilarious. And she's just put out the anthology collection of the Carolina Comets series in a binder and it has bonus content and I'm hanging out to read it. I haven't read it yet. Izzy did read it and she said, told me that it was fantastic. So I'm so looking forward to going back and reading it because I, I think she does a really good job with that. I don't think everyone does a good job with text thread conversations, but Tegan Hunter is one of the best. And that my friends is this wrap up. This is the shortest wrap up I've had in a little while. So editing me is going to be incredibly grateful. So grateful. In the comments I would love to know if you have read any of these books or if you're planning on picking any of them up. Otherwise feel free to share what you have been reading in the past week or leave me a phone emoji to let me know that you're here. I hope that wherever you are in the world you're staying safe and healthy and I will see you in my next video. Thanks so much for watching. Bye everyone.